Native Land Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reason Choice Media. What's up, what's up, what's up, everybody? This is Andrew Gillum coming to you with not the second, but the third episode of Native Land Pod, uh, where we break it all down for you, what's happening in politics, a little bit of what's happening in culture, but not too much of either. And the beauty of today is I get to do it with two of my favorite, favorite people, Tiffany Cross. And Miss Angela Rye. What's up, ladies? Hey, hey everybody. Andrew. Welcome Happy home, Happy to be back y'all. with you, number three. Welcome home. Can I just say really quickly, Welcome. before we get started, yes. I want to give a yes. shout out to The Gathering Spot. I'm broadcasting to you guys live Woo! from The Gathering Spot. Black-owned business. Um, and so just shout out to them for being a partner and host of, of Native Land Pod. So what up, Gathering Spot? Shout out to The Gathering Spot. Thank you, spot. Gathering Spot, for sharing some space with us. It's only a tiny bit of space because Tiffany's so fun size. <laughs> the disrespect for the petites out here. Why well, I tell you the People truth. People have been tweeting that. I'm like, let me find out Tiffany fun size. I'm like, yeah, fine. So disrespectful. <laughs> But you know what? Speaking of the I'm people, sorry, if this, uh, Tiffany, let me know. I need to go ahead and withdraw my offense if there's an offense. Oh, no, no disrespect, there's no brother. I'm vertically challenged. Okay. So now okay. everybody no, know my so secret. Good. I'm five two, but my attitude six one. So don't try it. All right, exactly. How about that? <laughs> but speaking of the people, well, you guys I also have. A... Uh huh. Yep. That whichever you well, was gonna I, say, I'm listening. I also have a slight confession, uh, which is, y'all, I had some er- oral surgery uh, in the past couple of days, and so if you are looking at this or even listening, you hear me, you know, mess up a word, a little kerfuffle here or there. <laughs> Just give me a little bit of grace today. Not a curveball. I'm trying. We're pushing through. And I'm uh, proud of you, brother. Because if it would have been me, I would have been under a bed Did somewhere. You? Y'all would have had to come get me. So shout out to you. Please believe the meds are in full effect today. Yeah. Uh, and full this in effect. Thank you for showing um, up, though, while you still a little bit under the weather. Because I've had hey, that surgery. it's only episode three, y'all. I can't be <laughs> quitting on you. Can't be yeah, you kind of can't. We, we might have came to your house uh, to come get you. Or or <laughs> all the listeners who we should probably thank. The people have been listening. They have been reviewing the podcast. We are so grateful that you're tuning in. But Andrew, on episode three, they definitely would have run to your house and be like, where you at, Gillum? Come through. <laughs> so we're grateful for that. Are, are you basically saying uh, the center of our listening universe is based here in Tallahassee? Yes. Yeah. I now think I think that there are planes, trains, anyway, and automobiles, though. We have an exciting show uh, for you all today. As I said in the intro, a little bit of news, a little bit of the culture, but not too much of either of them. But getting right to the news, uh, ladies. And I got to say this. Uh, because I remember doing this public speaking event and I and I greeted folks as ladies and gentlemen. And this one woman or, and two of her friends afterwards came up to me to say, we are not ladies. We are women. And she then gave me a whole thing uh, about the difference. And so just know that I know the difference, but I know my two colleagues Can you tell me the difference? are not offended. I would, I'm not try. I would like to know. You know, Cicely Tyson Apparently, used to drag people for not ladies saying ladies. Was associated with a dainty, you know, particular way of being, a a, 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 um, a trophy established upon women by men, um, more of a sort of status and social daintiness than it had to do with gender. I don't know, mind. Women. You can call me lady. I like to be woman. called a lady. If you look like me, you can call me girl. If you don't look like me, don't call me girl. <laughs> Please don't call me so whatever. Yeah, it's tip fine. Who, I'm with you on that. Yeah. And we're going to talk about baby later, yeah. huh? We're going to talk about that later. Yes, later. We're going to get to that. <laughs> we're going to get to that. Anyway, Andrew, you're mm. trying to get us to New Hampshire, I think, my brother. I am trying to get us to New Hampshire. We got so much to talk uh, about already. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> but we can take our time getting there. Um, in fact, we're, we're going to spend a long time in New Hampshire because by now, I'm sure all of you all know what happened. Uh, this Earlier this week, New Hampshire held a primary that, Angela, I think people projected to have a lower than what actually performed yeah. turnout on behalf of the Republicans. I don't know what you make of that, but essentially we had 
what was record turnout in New Hampshire for this primary election and the all able King Donald Trump appeared to have prevailed. Did I get the news right on that? Yeah, I think what's really fascinating is uh, I th- I thought a lot of people would you know kind of stick that one out, but they had more than three hundred thousand voters show out show up to participate in the New Hampshire primary, um, outpacing their performance, which was their original high mark in twenty sixteen. So it is fascinating to see folks come through and, as Tiffany would say, vote for their king. Yeah, can can I say though this is my big problem with New Hampshire? All right. First of all, the the issues that they voted on, their top four issues, it was um, the economy, immigration, um, foreign policy, and abortion. Okay, so that, that those were the top yeah. four issues. And then you saw reporter after reporter talking to voters, and they would ask, why are you voting for Donald Trump? And the, the random voter would say, oh, well, his policy aligns with mine. Now, did these reporters say, really, what policy specifically? No. Or they say, well, my life was better under Donald Trump. Really? How so? They just yeah. put these sound bites out there like t- like it's truth. And they would never challenge any of these folks on any of these things. Yeah. And that, to me, is so important. That's what I want to hear. What policies specifically align with you? And I'll keep saying this until the media gets it right. Never once was anybody asked, well, what do you make of his racism? What do you make of his misogyny? <laughs> what do you make of his xenophobia? What do you make of the 91 indictments? It was just, let's pretend none of this has happened and we're going to treat this like ev- like everything about this man is normal when nothing is normal and democracy is on the line. This has been my big drum that media influences, policy influences elections, and both are failing right now. I kept hearing about immigration, 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 immigration. Can somebody just put into context for me, what is, what is the immigration issue in, in, in New Hampshire? Like what? what are, are, is it the Canadians? Maybe coming in. Is you know it they Americans say the Canadians going out? real dangerous. I, Never hear that. I wonder why. On on horseback? Is it? Is it <laughs> not on what, horseback? What is it that makes? <laughs> I look. Yeah, I mean, I think the reality of it is people are mad. Yeah, I think people when they say immigration, I think what it is, is people are mad that the brown people crossing the border because most of these voters likely watch something, Mm. you know, like OAN or Fox News. They have it on a 24 hour doom Mm. loop in their home. And all they can see is my life is so shitty because all of these people keep coming in, taking resources from me. Um, This is the reason why I don't live in a bigger house because of these people. This is the reason why my kid can't get a job when he graduate college because of these people. There is no immigration immigration issue um, in New Hampshire, certainly not one that should be driving your interest at the ballot box. So I call BS on that. Um, it is racism under a different name, mass is policy. Uh, and we see you. Mm. We know the truth. You know, the thing Angela, that I- I'm curious to know, when was the last time you were in New Hampshire? Just curious. Uh, the first of February, actually. Um, so <laughs> hasn't happened. I don't, I don't think I've ever, I ain't never had a connecting flight through New Hampshire. I ain't never passed through to go somewhere else. You know, I just, I really haven't. So what, what, what about you? What the is, last time I was in New Hampshire was in 2020. Uh, Andrew and I were both fellows at the IOP at Harvard and we uh, did an event, uh, in, in New Hampshire. And so that was what, four years ago? Yeah, at, at, at least. And mine was, I mean, about four years ago, and it was a really quick, 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 quick stint, quick stint in there. The reason why I ask y'all is because New Hampshire harkens back to a comment that you made, Tiff, I think the last episode and maybe even the one before that when we talked about who shows up in these primaries. Right. Now, Angela did a great credit by talking about 300,000 more people. And of course, we salute, you know, more participation. But if I'm not mistaken, we're talking about the state that is pretty much a monolith. 94% white. Wherein, yeah. I was just pulling yeah. it up. I, I found 92.6 Tiffany to be on Jeopardy. That's good, Tiff. 92 points is what I just pulled up. I just wanted to see. There, 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 there it is. And that, that, that's not to say that people who look and sound and are from and all this kind of thing, uh, uh, same upbringing, same issues, on us, uh, one or the other, doesn't matter. It matters. But the interesting thing that I found about the New Hampshire primary was the fact that self-identified liberal or rather self-identified moderates and self-identified independents 
tend to coalesce around Nikki Haley. Mm -hmm. Whereas Mm -hmm. everybody else who was pretty much identified as just a Republican got behind Donald Trump. So Donald Trump got to see the coalescing of Republicans behind him. But this really interesting gap opened up, y'all. And I wonder if you take anything from this, that independents and no party affiliates who leaned more right, many of which said, that under no circumstance will they vote for Donald Trump. That group got behind Nikki Haley to the to the degree of, I don't know, 43 percent or so of them voted for her. Do you think this signals anything in the long term to be problematic for Donald Trump? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that the, the thing that we're seeing is there is a real divide in the Republican Party in terms of what they want out. Like we know that Donald Trump is absolutely what the the Republican Party has been building for many years. But I think that there are some folks, um, maybe the Karl Roves, the folks who were aso- associated with H.W. and W. Bush, who don't want it to be this outward, like this blatantly racist. Um, I would imagine the <laughs> the Condoleezza Rice's even of the world wouldn't want it this bad. Clarence don't care. Y'all see that. Clarence does not care. As long as you take him on a trip, he's good. But the rest of them, right, There's there may be some pause. I think with what is interesting is Nikki Haley being from the state of South Carolina um, and then having a senator who she appointed, um, somebody's brother, Tim Scott, but not mine, um, still, despite being, despite being appointed by her originally, being from the same state, said it is now time for me to endorse Donald Trump. Of course, we know he'd already dropped out of the presidential election, but New Hampshire had a solid 177 votes. I don't mean 1,000. I mean 177 votes for Tim Scott. And Tim Scott mm. took it upon himself this weekend to not endorse his fellow um, statesman, stateswoman south from South Carolina, but to endorse Donald J. Trump. I would love for us to roll the clip. Thank you. Let me say, we need a president who will close our southern border today. We need a president who understands the American people are sick and tired of being sick and tired. We need. He was having church with all them white folks who, who on Insurrection Day, he would have... I'm not even going to go there. Y'all know what would have happened to Tim Scott if they didn't recognize him on Insurrection Day. The point is he burned and said to hell with loyalty to this person who he's from the same state, who arguably shares some of the sentiment he might share around the Confederacy removed statue. I'm not a Nikki Haley fan who at least some parts of the day they both recognize that racism is a thing, even if it only happened to them and nobody else. But It's very bizarre to me that that was the approach that he took. And not only did he, well, I want you guys to talk about what you think about how he referenced Fannie Lou Hamer. I I just... Yeah, I was going to say that. I think that's the most offensive part um, because um, probably most of the audience couldn't even, you know, name um, that that quote came from Fannie Lou Hamer. And she stood for the complete opposite um, of what Tim Scott, Senator uh, Tim Scott says. And Tim Scott has often said that he went from cotton to Congress, which, I, you know, he's gone from cotton to Congress to clown. It's just embarrassing to watch Mm -hmm. this guy. But I will say, and so I kind of disagree with you when you say um, it's not a problem um, for or, or that, it, 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 that Donald Trump should be worried about this gap with he and Nikki Haley. I actually don't think he is worried. I think he's a, a bully who loves to pick on her. And I think he um, mathematically, it's, it doesn't show to be a big problem for him. He is the front runner. He will likely be the GOP nominee. And to watch people who say they would never vote for him just months ago. I'm not talking about 2020. Yeah. Just months ago, people say, I will never vote for this man. They have criticized him. And to watch them one after another line up behind this man is disgusting to see a black man do this Mm. is even more disgusting i don't know what tim scott is aiming to do when you say he dropped his uh, presidential race legit i forgot the man was running i want to insert that Oprah (laughs) meme and say did you drop or were you dropped because nobody was paying attention to his campaign and i think a lot of these people who launched these campaigns they're really angling for a position in donald trump's cabinet were he to be reelected, and have no real policy agenda um or anything they are loyal to power i really quick andrew i want to hear what you gotta say 
But I wanted to just clarify one point. The point that I was trying to make is for someone who's supposed to be like their guy, 100 grand, he is still barely clearing half, 50%. He should be in a primary in the 70 percentile, 80. Like he should be killing it. He's not killing it. And that is the part where I think it's a flag. Do we think that that Mm -hmm. his arrogant self is concerned about anything? No. Anyway, I want to hear you, Andrew, but I just wanted to clarify that one point. No, no, that, that that's fair. And I actually tend to agree with you that, first of all, as the former president of the United States, such an embarrassing time for the country, that he wouldn't have an opponent if he it were, as a former president, running for the nomination of his party again. So the fact that he's only pulling half of the Republican Party should seem a little problematic to him, but it won't. On, on the Tim Scott thing, man, it this guy was appointed what, didn't he get appointed by Nikki Haley when yes. she was governor? That's what Angela that, said. Yeah. I, 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 there is a particular disdain that he has for her. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's more than what meets the eye. Probably mm-hmm. not worth our time and consideration. But you know, I'm just curious to know what the there there is as it relates to them. Um, I do think for the Republican primary, Trump not having the independents and moderates behind him is 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 probably nothing he'll get the nomination but i think in the general election this thing is going to rear its hair, head yeah, again for sure and this is probably where you're going to see biden and harris try to come up the center we're going to be scratching our head at some of the advertisements that happen i think later on in the campaign um but but but, but when we do scratch our head let's just Double back to this moment, to this conversation, and we start to think about, well, who are they trying to get? Right. Who are we trying to bring to our side? And I think it's going to make a lot more sense some of the tactical moves that you see the Democrats in this campaign take later yeah. uh, in the cycle. You know, but I said to the audience on episode one, mm-hmm. the reason why these primaries mattered is because this is when the field starts to widow. Yeah. It has been whittling down ever since and just before that primary. And I think this thing's about to be over and and probably a few, a, a few short weeks, if not sooner. Well, that's just my guess. Well, yeah. you, uh, oh, go ahead, Angela. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say really quick, you were talking about doubling down. Tim Scott doubled down after, of course, um, Donald Trump uh, proclaimed victory last night. Um, Donald Trump had a lot to say about why he's abandoning Nikki Haley in this way. And we get to hear what Tim Scott's response was. Did you ever think that she actually appointed you, Tim? (laughs) And think of it, appointed and you're the senator of his state and she endorsed me. You must really hate her. (laughs) No, it's uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. Uh oh. I just love you. No, that's that's why he's a great politician. Ugh. Ugh. Lord help I'm so me. Let, I mean, for that man. I, yeah. I, I do not even claim him, so I am not embarrassed. You know, it is what it is. It, I was about to say we got to roll on. The line, the line on. is shorter. We should roll on because he about to get rolled over. The problem is he didn't did all this stuff. He didn't propose to this woman that he probably don't know that well. He has thrown the governor or the former governor who actually appointed him under the bus. And 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 the, found, the people said the lady is a scammer and was a scammer with her with her ex husband. But he's doing all that. You know why? Oh. He wants to be the VP, and he is about to see. It's not gonna happen. He's on a FAFO mission. We can't cuss no more. But y'all look up what a FAFO mission is. That is what Tim Scott is on. We can roll on. Andrew. I, you know, I just had well, to... I just love you. Go, go, go ahead, Tip, and then we'll roll through it. Jesus, well, I man. just because you brought up the general, and I think that's where the, like we know what the general's gonna look like. You know, it, pe- yeah. people as crappy a year as twenty twenty was, people are like, let's do that again. So if we're looking at Donald <laughs> Trump and um versus Joe Biden, I, I want to shift the subject a bit to talk about the political yeah. adver- advertisement, the political advertisements that you brought up, Andrew, yeah. because we have seen this act before, and what we have now is an outsized influence on our political elections. And what I'm talking about is artificial intelligence. AI mm-hmm. is going to wreak havoc on elections. I want to just let our um, our listeners and our audience members know 
that this week, uh, NBC News reported that the folks in New Hampshire were receiving robocalls, fake robocalls from President Joe Biden, discouraging people to participate in the New Hampshire primary. This is nothing new. This has happened in Senate races. Uh, when Ron mm-hmm. Kirk ran for Senate in Texas, there were fake robocalls leading him. I think when we think about what happens in AI in our elections, we are lacking in imagination and how dangerous this can be. Yes. This year alone, over 2 billion people across the globe will vote and choose their elected representatives. The fact that AI is going to have this big influence can influence our elections, not only in disinformation, uh, but literally in the mechanics of how we elect uh, these leaders. And I just think the big question we're asking around AI is, is it sci-fi or is it horror? And we we really, you know, don't know um, at this point. And I think we have to make sure that AI is in our hands and we are not in its hands. It even even has a a big impact on media. Um, We have to remember that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. They are pooling from people. And if the majority of people they're pooling from are white folks, then that's going to drive a lot of AI. Um, It is not intelligent. So it's pulling from the dumbest people. And that's, that's going to wreak havoc as well. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I think you're right. You're, you're, you're right on the money with this one. And I think we should hear a little bit. One, just an example of how, how artificial intelligence played a role with some of the deep fake robocalls yes. uh, from Joe Biden just this last New Hampshire election a, a few days ago. Let's hear it. Voting this Tuesday only enables the Republicans in their quest to elect Donald Trump again. Your vote makes a difference in November, not this Tuesday. Unbelievable. Man. So if you if you missed what that was, mm-hmm. this was a a photo, a, a robocall being sent into households in New Hampshire telling voters that while defeating Donald Trump is important, it's important to do that in November and not for them to go and participate in the primaries that were held this past Tuesday, encouraging people basically to to stay home. And, and, and you all may remember this from from my race and, 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 and even from some other races that took place during the time of robocalls going into people's homes uh, of the voices of pastors and reverends and, 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 and other, you know, identifiable African-Americans making calls, basically saying, hey, don't get fooled. The election is not this Tuesday. It's next Tuesday. Crazy. Stay in line. This, you know, this sort of thing. So really mimicking the the types of calls and clarion calls that come from pulpits and many African-American leaders saying, hey, if you're in line, stay in line. That's legit. Right. We've often said that. But to confuse the election date saying that it's not the first Tuesday of, 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 of every uh, uh, November, it's going to be the next Tuesday that you're supposed to show up and vote. That can have a deleterious effect on the outcome of the election when you consider that not everybody knows when election day always is. And oftentimes these are going to be voices that seemingly are of our community, from our community, targeted toward our community, except in fact, it's not us at all. It's artificial intelligence being piped into their, into their, into their phones. You know, the thing that is scary to me, and I was trying to listen for, something that would indicate that that robocall was not him, you know, something that would indicate that, it, you know, like what what about the cadence of his of his speech? Is there something that tips us off that it's not real? And at the end of it playing, I'm like, man. And the reason why is because I'm like, why can't I tell that it's fake? And so you just feel so it's bad. Intense. Part of what I'm wrestling with you guys, and I'm sure you're dealing with this, too, as our parents age is there are so many different kind of scams to in that that specifically really target our seniors. Robocalls probably for yeah. the most part are targeting seniors. Young people are texting and you know on social in other ways. Although my mom, shout out to mom and daddy, always on Facebook. But like I literally walked in on my dad probably I don't know maybe six months ago in the summer. He's on the phone arguing with someone from Amazon about something that he didn't purchase and they're trying to get him to give his debit card number so that they could refund him this money. And I I was like in the kitchen and kind of halfway listening. I was like, wait, who are you talking to? And he was like, Amazon. I was like, they don't even call. So I snatched the phone. I was like, I suggest you hang this phone up right now before I call the feds on that ass. 
Sorry, daddy, but that's what happened and he knows it. But like literally, and and the reason why I'm bringing that up is because AI isn't just hurting us and, and engaging in voter suppression. It is literally causing our parents, our elders to like spend me- excess resources that they don't have. It is fraudulent on all fronts. And so, of course, it's going to impact the electoral system. So we have to be hyper vigilant and super aware. And then we have to figure out a way to discern truth from a lie, even when it is a voice that we all know. That's a lot. You know, so anyway, Amazon. I just I want to point out really quickly, yeah, Angela. I love that you brought up yeah. the fact that a lot of seniors are are targeted by this. Yeah. Um, I also want to point out because you said your parents spend a lot of time on Facebook. Well, these mega mm-hmm. social media companies like um, Meta, like Amazon, like X, Twitter, whatever we're calling it these days, they have fired a lot of people who were in position to safeguard. Um, some of these AI efforts yeah, to infiltrate these true, platforms, Tiff. those people have been fired in sweeping numbers. We saw this over the years and nobody, a lot of people were, were, were waving a red flag saying, hey, this isn't a good idea. And those positions, as far as I know, have not been replaced. So that's something to think about when you're on social media. Man. Well, I just, I, I really hate that they have determined that it is no longer their responsibility to play in this space when they are, They are the platforms by which many of these scams are being perpetuated. You've created the space. You've created the the ring in which the the game is being played. But somehow you're not responsible for referees. You're not responsible for safeguards. You run up, you know, uh, against the stand and you break a leg or your nose or you're this. There's no responsibility to be shared whatsoever. And I got to say, it's a big reflection of our regulatory environment, yeah. which has really played kid gloves with a lot of these companies, basically, you know, taking the leash off and saying, well, if we start to regulate artificial intelligence, then we're going to stifle creativity, innovation, and growth in these sectors. Right. You saw this come to a head this past summer during congressional hearings. Yeah where the Biden administration did get out there and basically say, you know, we don't want to put handcuffs on innovation yet. Let's let it, you know, lead a bit. And then the regulation is going to follow. And I just think that this is a mistake. And I think we are badly, badly misestimating the ways in which this is harmful to our democracy and the way that it's going to show up this election cycle. And in a race where you're talking about the difference between the winner and the loser being a point. Yeah, exactly. Represented by a couple of votes every precinct. You can start to calculate how very quick, fast, and in a hurry the 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 the, the other side realizes that we're playing in margins. Yeah. We're not changing whole communities and whole societies. We're just in the indentations, the very, very small, unwritable places that are making the big difference here. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Well, All right. And I, honestly, AI mm-hmm. is scaring me. I want to I want to move on if we can. <laughs> is, exactly. is it sci-fi or horror? Right now, it feels like horror. <laughs> it is horror. And Next I topic. Hate what to- else right. we talking about? Well, y'all, we can keep going with this AI thing, but I'm getting freaked out. So I think it's time to pay some bills. Let's take a break real quick. Well, I hate to make it worse for y'all after the break, but it's still a little bit of horror and gloom and doom. What did you say earlier, Tiff? What was the, what was the <laughs> gloom doom, doom cycle or something? Doom loop. Yeah. The doom loop. She be coming up. I mean, you Tiff, these catchphrases. They're so these good. catchphrases, though? If, if, if the Democratic Party could hire Tiffany Cross to lead them in messaging, they would probably no, be doing you. all right. Oh, well, <laughs> then there's that. Okay, so here's the thing, though. This is a place where I think the Democrats are killing it from a messaging standpoint. As you all know, we're just on the other side um, of the 51st anniversary of Roe versus Wade. And um, in 2022, of course, the Supreme Court overturned Roe in the Dobbs decision. However, Kamala Harris, Madam Vice President, who we know, and I just talked about this last week, is fantastic at prosecuting the cases against a thing. I wanted it to be against racism, but Kamala showed you how to get it done when she went to Wisconsin um, as they face this a uh, new bill that's been introduced to ban abortion after 14 weeks. Um, there would be an abortion ban. She took abortion head on. She talked about what was at stake with the Wisconsin law, but she also talked about what would happen if a national ban were to make it to President Biden's desk. In America, freedom is not to be given. 
It is not to be bestowed. It is ours by right. <laughs> by right. And that includes the freedom to make decisions about one's own body, not the government telling you what to do. This afternoon in the Wisconsin legislature, extremists will hold a hearing on a new bill that would ban abortion in this state with no exception for rape and incest. And in the United States Congress, extremists are trying to pass a national abortion ban to outlaw abortion in every single state. But what they need to know is that if Congress passes a national abortion ban, President Joe Biden will veto it. So, so here's the thing. We talked about last week um, the importance of um, Vice President Harris being on the road, kind of prosecuting the case against the things. I know that people desperately want to hear what the Democratic Party will do for them going forward. How have these accomplishments that they've made helped people in a really tangible way? But the thing that I love about this is this calls women, ladies, no matter what we're saying, Andrew, straight to the carpet and reminds them all, particularly the 53 percent of white women who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, where are you going to stand? You want to be a single voter issue about life? Do you really want the government making these decisions for women? It has been too long where the government has put, positioned itself to make decisions for us and not doing the same thing for them for men. And so I really appreciated her being in this role, um, not only fighting against a potential national ban at the 51st anniversary of Roe, but also taking it straight to the Wisconsin state legislature. And we all know that Wisconsin is a battleground state. I thought it was super smart tactically, geographically, messaging wise. I just appreciated this. I love to hear what y'all thought. I thought she did a, a great job, to your point, prosecuting the case. I, it makes me nervous. Her her messaging there aside, I, she did a great job. I'm passionate about this issue for sure. Her messaging mm -hmm. aside, though, Angela, it does make me nervous if we're trying to appeal to white women to show up to help save this country <laughs> because they a, a white women outpaced white men in their support for Brian Kemp when he ran for governor in 2016 in Georgia, and they voted for him because he was introducing that abortion ban uh, in Georgia that ended up having potentially having bad uh, economic impact on, on, on the state. So I, I, look, I, it, whatever it takes, everybody show up. Her messaging was great. But if we got to depend on folks outside of us, I'm just not sure that's enough to keep Donald Trump from the Oval Office, quite frankly, as scary as that is. God, I hope you're wrong. Uh, Me too. Uh, by every by every measure. Um, but to, to Angela's original point, which is to say that this was a clear example of the vice president going in unleashed, unrehearsed, unchecked, unbothered, really by opinions of others, but rather getting to the point uh, of saying, look, I'm so frustrated, but I also feel so free to talk about that level of frustration, mm -hmm. what drives it, um, what animated her in that moment. Um, it is true. This is the kind of, of, of animated and anger filled moment that I think we, we wanted to hear a little bit more of when we were, when we were reviewing that piece um, uh, on race um, that she, that she sat down with the view on. And I just got to say, I think part of what gives the vice president gave her license on this issue is the broad based support appearingly from white women, majority white men in some of these uh, elections that have taken place where it's been essentially a vote on whether or not you stand by a woman's right to choose or not. And frankly, the motivations may have been different for what got them to where they are on the issue, but they cast the vote the same, which was to say, no, government, you don't have a seat in this room. We're taking the seat back. Leave it between a woman and her doctor. Um, case after case after case where this has been on the ballot in states, both red, blue, and purple. Um, I said both, but all three, everything in between, 
we still come out on the right side of this issue. And I think the vice president felt that license to be able to say it's unfortunate that we still don't yet have that license uh, that has been well earned, uh, well established on the issue of race in this country. But certainly on this issue, I think she felt licensed. And to your point, Angela, she prosecuted it like a prosecutor would. She tore it from, you know, uh, uh, to quote Boomerang from Ruta to Tuta. Not to quote Boomerang. Y'all ain't going to get that Boomerang reference. <laughs> no, I got, we got it. it. I got it. Got to coordinate. You know, whatever. Anyway, okay. Um, well, there's that. I just I just thought we should acknowledge when they do the things that we're encouraging. And so kudos sure. to y'all. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Kudos, kudos to y'all. Kudos, Madam Vice President. Thank you for that. All right. I was saying kudos to Native Land Pod, Tiff. That's what I was saying. Shout y'all out. Thank you. I just want to thank y'all. I want to shout out Native Land Pod. (laughs) Yeah. I'm still feeling shady about But also uh, kudos uh, to Madam uh, BP. Boomerang. You are? I was was telling you I was with you, and then I was trying to figure out why you made the movie an episode. I'm joking. I'm joking. 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 All right. Well, what else are we talking about? Speaking of Wisconsin, we know politics are everywhere, Tiff. So Everywhere. Let's talk about what I know you love. You know, you're the in house resident expert on sports, but also entertainment. What's going on? What's going yes. on? Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to talk <laughs> about award season because y'all know um I the, the Oscar nominations came out this week and uh, there was a lot of chatter about it. But I really wanted to talk to you guys about award season in general because uh, there's a diversity problem, as you may have heard, uh, in Hollywood. So I, I do want to shout out Killers of the Flower Moon. People, Some people liked it, some people didn't, but at least there was indigenous representation at the Oscars, which is long overdue. Um, Jeffrey Wright in American Fiction, yes, Sterling K. Brown, so uh, and Danielle Brooks uh, for The Color Purple. So yes. I, I love seeing an API community um, was nominated. I love seeing some of the diversity. But Angela, this is my issue. Um, Coleman Domingo uh, too one, from I Rustin. Do, oh yes, thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah. But here's Beautiful. the thing: the award shows to me still come across like this is white man's land. You know, it is still yeah. overwhelmingly white people saying, "Do we select you? Do we like you or not?" From the Oscars to the Emmys to the Grammys, and mm-hmm. I just have stopped putting a lot of credence into some of these award shows. And to me, it worth celebrating the diversity in front of the camera, um, which is good. Thirty percent um, uh, or movies that had a title main character black actor went up 30 percent since 2022 we like that but we got to talk about diversity behind the camera and a lot if you remember i know you probably remember this angela i think variety uh maybe the hollywood reporter variety did a whole spread on the number of black women executives who were leaving some of these major studios everybody from warner brothers to discovery and these are people who have power they have green light power um they they were leading some of the dei efforts and it's just shameful So I don't know what it takes for us to build and create our own. But I know when I see the creativity that exists among black folks on social media, I'm like, what would entertainment be without us? So I don't know how we fix this. Angela, you're in L.A. I feel like you have your hand on the pulse um, or finger on the pulse of of the community. And and you sit at the intersection of a lot of things, including entertainment, politics, policy, all of that. So you're so dope. And my sister. Um, So I'm really curious your thoughts on this, because it's it's frustrating to be mad about it and also want to celebrate it at the same time yeah i am um, you know thankfully i don't have my pulse too much on this community um being rooted in or groomed in politics for by congresswoman water so i was like for real la not hollywood it's a difference and then also seattle yeah. so definitely keeping them roots but i think that what's frustrating to me is there are these incredible actors also coleman domingo style man watch him on the carpet y'all he is killing it but they are sh- every time, like nails it every time. They are shining. And Danielle Brooks deserved, I honestly thought Taraji deserved a nod. Yes. She killed it as Suge. I'm also partial because of everything she's been saying. And I want her to get up on the stage, accept an award and say it again um, where nobody can run yeah. from it. And then the other thing I'll tell you that I was really disappointed by, Tiff, you know, in our girls chat, we've been talking a lot about how powerful origin is. I was so yes. disappointed that there it was a complete snub, and I would argue. I thought they this missed is the Ava du- It says Ava DuVernay's origin has been notably shut out of the award circuit this season, not receiving any Golden Globes, Critics Choice Awards, or SAG Award nominations. 
Um, so Origin she had miss been. Origin had been a possible Oscars hopeful, but it was ultimately shut out. I don't know if shut out means that she missed the deadline. No, they um, would have said if she missed the deadline. So I take that back. I retract my statement. So, so well, why I do think, you think to let's this, say she didn't? Why do you think that? Why why do you think she wasn't nominated? I think because she didn't need to go through a big studio. And I think that right now, you know, big Hollywood wants to make this point that like in order for it to be official, in order for it to be credible, in order for it to be um, um, good enough, you need to go through our process. That process rewards old, traditionally white power structures. The same thing we talk about industry wide. And I think this is no different. This is the film that got an eight minute standing ovation in Venice. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Like this is, this is like an incredible work where when I saw it in, at the New York premiere, there was a five minute standing ovation. Like I, I just, I don't understand. I, I, I would like to understand what we're talking about, especially because she pushed to do this herself, to get the the financing from the philanthropic community, from other folks who would donate to it, because she knew it needed to come out before the election. She knew that democracy was on the line. And so she wanted people to see where this types of these types of ugly ide- ideologies come from. And that's why she put out this film based off of Isabel Wilkerson's cast. So I just... I don't know. I don't I don't know what all goes into it, but I can tell you every single award season, I'm happy for some folks, but really pissed about some other things. And this is one of those things that I'm really pissed about. Because do we care? You know, like to me, if you get an Oscar nod uh, again, we're we're begging the white man, please pay attention to us. Please give us one of your awards. Yeah, I'd rather her see economic success at the box office. You know, yeah. I, if there's some kind of way we can bypass the gatekeepers who rarely allow us access to this kind of thing. I'm all for it. Andrew, what what you say? Yeah. Well, I say we should go where we get love. Right. And sometimes those places are ones that we create for ourselves. And sometimes that love comes from places that we didn't necessarily anticipate, oh. which brings me oh, to Lord. this next topic, which I knew where you were going. <laughs> I love this. That was the smoothest. And you get the transition award. That I was love amazing. that transition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Go, AG. Okay, like, let me show let's you. Bring let's bring Go do your thing. Is this topic of when a black woman calls me baby. Ciao. There's this video on social media it? that's been making the rounds. Yeah, let's play it. We and have we to are going to be making it. Yeah, we're going to play it. Oh, you still I laying just want out. To Sorry. Say okay. That, that really, it touched me because. I know the feeling um, <laughs> and I'm certain that it is probably layered with all this other stuff that we're going to throw up on it today, but let's just take it in its innocent form. Let's play Rachel. I pray to God that this does not come off as offensive to anybody because I mean this with the utmost love and respect from the bottom of my whole entire heart. But when a black woman calls me baby, there is so much i what kind of magic are you putting in there because that shit hits harder than crack i every single time every encounter in my life that i have had with a black woman where she calls me baby i have never felt more loved and supported in my entire life i feel almost imprinted on like like are you my mother i feel her um I know that this is probably, I feel, I, 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 she conditioned this video saying, I hope this does not offend anybody. I hope this is, you know, so I think this is out of the goodness of her heart, but it's true. And for me, it was the lunchroom ladies when I was going like elementary school and it would be like, you know, baby this, or baby, you need to put some such and such on there or or just the compliment and it ended with a baby. Or it was a direction and instruction and baby was somewhere in there. I just felt like they knew me. They probably did. I was probably one of their bad A, you know, grandbabies <laughs> or something. But it touched a special place. But I've grown up with it. And so I think I kind of don't give it the weight and the value you know, the way that you it pierced this time. woman, yeah. it probably, I, I, it's so normal. It's so baked in the cake for me that it doesn't, that, that I don't say it enough, but I felt this woman. And when you consider growing up in a household where you may not get that kind of a reframe, 
Um, I'm just saying, I, I, I see how in the run of the mill day, when this is not your normal and it happens and it pierces you so much so that it stops you in your track and you just have to interrogate my goodness. Why did this hit me the way that it hit me? And why do I feel the way that I feel? And I think that there is a long history of the role that black women have played in all of our lives and in the life of a nation the that that probably gives a better explanation of it yeah but in addition to it having made me laugh Mm -hmm. it also pierced me because it reminded me of an all too comfortable feeling that i get um when i hear it not in disrespect when i hear it not in condescension but when i hear it in the true love that is i think being communicated for someone, if this is not your every day, I get how we can stop you and pause you in your tracks. That's it. Nothing deep. Just saying. Well, um, Tiff, I don't know if you want me. I can just I can try. I got a lot to say close. about it. I'm letting y'all okay, go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be brief so you can close this out, preacher. This what is what means. I want to say. Okay. In um, you know, we talk about our arrival onto the shores of this country and um. In my book manuscript, I believe it will stay in the book um, that that will have a release date eventually that I'll share. Um, (laughs) I talk about how the experiences of our ancestors reside in our DNA, you know, for the good, the Mm -hmm. bad, the ugly and the indifferent. And our ancestors who were stolen from the continent and brought here Um, through the institution of slavery, participated in something called wet nursing. Wet nursing Mm -hmm. is when um, slave masters um, relied upon black women to breastfeed their white children. And so there is this inherent connection to um, (laughs) our community. Um, We know that we, in a lot of ways, shaped culture. Um, there are so many things that, you know, I believe when we just, when we say things that are such a discerning people, it hits different. I do think this video was funny and cute and yeah, it was resonant, but also I would be lying to y'all if I didn't say there was something in me that was like, oh, that kind of cringed um, and was frustrated by it. I'm glad that she shared it. That's her truth. But also mm-hmm. I'm like, sis, if you only knew the history behind this and yeah, it does something different in you. It resonates right with your great, great grandmother that might've been on the bosom of one of our great, great, great grandmothers. Right. So Mm -hmm. I was triggered by that. And I hate to, you know, I hate when I'm seeing something on social and be like, y'all so whack, you know, they didn't mean it like that. And I know she didn't, but I think that we would be remiss if we didn't take these opportunities to teach history when we have the opportunity to teach history, because they're literally trying to peel out these real, very tangible stories out of history books. So, yeah, I want you to know about yeah. wet nursing. I want y'all to look it up because it was a real thing. Tiff, it's your, yeah. you have the floor, man. Well, I one, I was not offended by the video. Um, I don't have the expectation that she would know the history. I think uh, kudos to you, Angela, for encouraging her to know the history. My um, challenge with the video is, one, I, I felt like, oh, this is sweet and cute and it's warm and I'm happy that she had that experience. However... White women sit at the right hand of power. Um, Angela brought up the slave trade. White women were a lot. They couldn't vote. They couldn't own property uh, in terms of housing, but they could own a person. They could participate in the buying and selling of the enslaved. And so I think we have always had to deep, so reach deep down in our humanity um, to be able to nurse their babies, uh, like Angela said, and, and care for their children while, while ours were kidnapped. But when you look at that through the lens of present day, um, I just think about the role white women play in society. And I believe this woman genuinely feels loved when a white when we call you know white people or call anybody when when, when black women say baby it is a loving um term of endearment however um i would love for white women to offer something uh in, in in the same value i would love for white women to not constantly be the people who are calling the police on us disproportionately there have been 41 white women governors not a single black woman governor and i bet if white women were willing to vote for a black woman governor we'd see some white women hold 4.4 percent of ceo positions black women 0.2 percent i bet there'd be more if there were white women to support them in that endeavor uh white women far outdo us in the wealth 
gap. And every equal payday, you hear white women all the time saying, you know, we earn 80 percent on a dollar, never acknowledging that that figure is very specific to white women. When it comes to black women, API women, indigenous women, those numbers are different. Um, They are the loudest voices against affirmative action, um, despite being uh, equal or even greater beneficiaries of it. Uh, Every time, mostly they choose race over gender. So if you like it when we call you baby, I want to tell you we would love it if we could call you ally. Woo! <laughs> hey, we definitely cut that real. for social. God dang! You know what? <laughs> the doors I, of the I church are now both open. Of you for, for reminding us of what it means to have a platform like this. <laughs> My God! To not just take what is the obvious. But to state what might not be the most obvious and use it as a call up, call out, a call up uh, to action for folks. And I also still want to say that it's okay for those of us who received this, because I think both my co-hosts received this originally in its intended form, which was for joy and lacrity and 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 all the 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 fun of it all. Um, that it's okay to still share joy and fun filled social media videos and that this that and the other. Just know that if it gets called up on this show, that is. It's got to be packing something and be ready to 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 rumble with the history and the facts and to know that it's seated in something, uh, something something greater. But um, um, you're allowed to have joy too, y'all. You're allowed to have. Joy. I would like to vote to name um, this episode. Uh, call me baby. I call you ally. Call me baby. Call you ally. Like this was such baby, a slay. Tip, you killed it. Oh my god! And, and off the top I, of the dome, you talking about somebody that got bars? Tiff, you are in the top five, my G. Like you killed that, <laughs> man. It. Speaking of it. um, Thank killing god, it, probably. Andrew. And you know, we want to yeah. make sure that we keep the table open. You think it's time for Q and A? I do think it's time for some. Question and answer after we pay some bills. I do. I do. I'm with you. All right. We're back. We're back. We're back. Well, as you all know, we said from the very, 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 very beginning that this show was about inviting you into the conversation and centering the experiences that we have um, at the centerfold of the conversation. And so... We want to do that by tossing this on over to some listener questions, which we're going to hear directly from you. Bless you, bless you. Bringing you greetings from the Ark of Covenant Ministries. My name is Cecil Ward, and I'm posing this question to the Native Land Podcast. In a world where war is inevitable, our democracy is being threatened. We even had our own president, President Biden, tell us that this time when we vote, our freedom and our democracy will be on the ballot. While still believing uh, that the faith-based community is still the last frontier of spirit-led activism in the earth, Uh, Aside from knowing that, where do you see the faith-based community faring in the midst of so much disarray when it looks like everything is subject to change? How do we fare in the lineup? Look, I think... I like this question for a few reasons. One, it's so often in the media, you hear people talk about evangelicals. It's like the white is silent. You know, somehow this group mm-hmm. of very right wing extremists have uh, co-opted this term as as though they represent it. And there was a study that came out a few years ago. I don't want to misquote it. But a majority of the folks who identify as evangelical, who the media references, um, do not actually go to a church. They uh, are members of the MAGA church, not a mega church. And so when we talk about the role of faith in politics, I think um, there is a reckoning that has to happen in the black church around some of the things that are preached from the pulpit. Not everyone is in church every Sunday. I don't go to church every Sunday. I haven't been to church in years. Um, I feel very comfortable with that decision. I think some of the policies that are pushed out from the pulpit don't always serve our communities. Um, And a lot of people feel unwelcome with some of the messaging that happens in the black church. So I uh, appreciate his his point, and I think there is certainly 
certainly always a role for a church to play. It's been a home of organizing um, in our communities, but I do think we have to branch out. And I think instead of uh, inviting folks to come into the church, the church might need to go into the community uh, and, and make their efforts known there um, and make sure that the policies they're supporting not only, uh, you know, adhere to the teachings of the Bible that they um, represent, but make sure that people feel welcome in the way that I think they would say that Jesus would want people to feel welcome. Peace and blessings. It's your boy R.J. Miller here and y'all up from Des Moines, Iowa. So my biggest thing is how do we get the Democratic Party to work for our black and brown brothers and sisters that are in, that are in our local area, you know, on a, on a city or local level and on a, on a state level? You know, I, I would like to know what, what should we do to, to improve the Democratic Party to make it work for us? Also, I think you guys should clarify what you guys mean by um, democracy for our viewers that may not be educated in democracy because everybody didn't take a civics classes and everybody didn't go to college for it. I um, I really love um, his question. And I'm sorry, this is RJ. Um, and RJ, I want to just commend you for sending it in. I, I'm so encouraged by this question because what he's really talking about is how to organize on every level. And what does accountability really, really look like? I think that the moment that we believe that we're worthy enough to have a voice and to have an, a perspective and that our elected officials should push an agenda for us, that we that we have the power to persuade them and then they must act because we put them there. So whether you voted for the person or not, once they are in office, they work for you because you are a taxpayer. Full stop. If you voted for them, you have even more leverage. Be the way that our system is structured right now, if you f help to finance their campaign, you have even more leverage. One day I hope that changes, but that is what it is right now. On every single level, there are laws that, that are passed, ordinances, executive actions, bills that are passed that impact our everyday lives. So I think the most important thing we, do, we can do is get familiar with what those things are. Get our top three to five things and say, I know he brought up um, voter disenfranchisement. He brought up returning citizens and the importance of them being able to have their say. What does it look like to ensure that folks always have access to the ballot box? What does it mean to democratize that access? When we talk about democracy, we're talking about a kind of government that serves the people one person, one vote, right? It doesn't mean that we make it harder to get to the ballot box. It doesn't mean that we try to silence you. We don't pick up the phone when you call. You, we do politics for the people. That means the people must instruct the politics. Policy must be people-led. We must be a compassionate kind of government. We don't, haven't always been that way. It hasn't been that way. I don't even feel comfortable saying we. It has not always been that way. It now must change. And so I know I did it once before. I'm going to do it again. Shout out to our good sister and friend, um, Alicia Garza, who runs the Black Futures Lab. They created the Black Census Project. Um, soon, I think by the summer, uh, Black to the Future Action Fund will come out with a black agenda that will be operational on every single level, starting from the local, local, state and federal government. So hopefully that helps, RJ. We really appreciate your question. All right. Next question. Hey, Native Island Podcast. Uh, my name is Brandon. Um, I'm originally from the Bahamas, but came to the U.S. in 2003 for college. Um, and recently, a few years ago, became a U.S. citizen. Uh, got tired of paying taxes and not being able to vote. <laughs> anyway, um, today I heard some uh, very troubling comments uh, from Charlie Kirk, uh, where in which he called MLK a bad guy and wanted to, you know, unravel the myth of him, um, as well as talking uh, really harshly about the. Uh, Civil Rights Act and how um, it reshaped America in a negative way. Um, and so I'm really curious on what your all your thoughts are um, on that, um, especially in your last episode relating back to Nikki Haley's uh, comments regarding America was never a racist country. Oh, Who want to take that? Andrew, you do I this definitely one? don't want to talk about Charlie Kirk. It, it would be one long <laughs> beep if I answered this question. <laughs> so I talked that to somebody else. Andrew, you want to take it? <laughs> then let that be the answer. Yeah. I think it's, I, I, <laughs> well, I don't want to completely dismiss this brother for his question. Um, yeah. I pre pre appreciate his question. And I think the point that he made without even asking is he was paying taxes without being represented here in the United yes. States um, yes. uh, on the mainland. So uh, I think that is a, a, an important point to make. And I look, in, in terms of Charlie Kirk, this is somebody who says asinine things um, for the sole purpose of getting attention. So with 
the utmost respect to this brother for asking this question. Um, I would just say we will not lend Native Land Pod um, to address his nonsense. Um, I think it would be disrespectful to our listeners and our audience um, to even give any credence to what he said about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I think most folks who are listening to this podcast know the role that Dr. King played very well. And we can we don't have to ask the question, is this a racist country? That question has been asked and answered. We don't have to ask the question, uh, what impact the civil rights um, legislation had on the country. We are living examples of it. And in the words of Dr. King, who uh, said this in an interview with NBC News, I want to say in 1964, we have a long, long, long way to go. Mm. You know, not giving any credence to Mr. Kirk, um, but simply saying we we're not, we need to stop making messiahs out of men, mm. um, period, because Dr. King walked the earth like a man, born into it by a mother, raised by a mother and a father, cultivated and shaped by a s- society, and took extraordinary steps uh, to try to make life better where he stood, and we all got to reap the benefits from it. And shouldn't we all, I think, accept that charge, which is right where we are, to do our part, whatever that part may be, small, middle, large, uh, to try to make things better where we are. You did so, questioner, by saying you were done paying taxes without the full rights of citizenship. Now you have that right. And now we charge you further to try to make this whole thing a little bit better for those that come behind you. I think that's all any of us can be asked to do. And, and, and really all any of us should be, should call ourselves to do is to try to make it better for those who come behind us. I love it. Yeah. I, I do want to just acknowledge um, we are especially not going to give credence to misinformation on this show um, on the other side of the death of Dexter King. Um, so this, this mm-hmm. the King family has been through so much. So we just want to send our, condolences um, to the family, to Martin III, to Bernice, um, to everyone in that family. We know that you all have been through so much, and we certainly honor um, the legacy of your tr- wonderful father, and thank you for sharing him with the world, and we're not going to get into this nonsense, so we'll go to the next question. We got another question. Yep, last one. It's from Tallahassee, uh-huh. so pay attention. Pay attention, okay. Reverend Dr. Gillum. Hello, Native Land Podcast. My name is Natalie Gaiman and I am in Tallahassee, Florida. I just wanted to say that I love the space that you all provide for us. My question is, what steps can the black community take to correct our self-sabotage crabs in a bucket mentality that has been ingrained in us from slavery? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, that's crib, y'all. She said mm-hmm. Tallahassee, Florida. That's what she and said. And maybe each one of us may want to just offer, uh, you know, a quick suggestion. And mine simply would be uh, what we can do to stop it is not participate in it. Mm. So if we all make the choice to just extract ourselves, when that conversation goes left in the crabs in a bucket, you're like, oh, no, that ain't my lane. I'm stepping out, bagging up. That's a huge contribution, and by no means do I mean that as a throwaway suggestion. That's a very real suggestion. It'll stop, it'll stop having life, it'll stop having breath when we start giving it life and stop giving it breath. Don't participate. That ain't my lane. Yeah, I love it. Two You got something on it? I got something on it. Oh, you do? Okay, well, go I'll, for it. I got two shades. A, a quick one. <laughs> two shades. Okay. My quick one is. Um, I would hesitate at putting this uh, crabs in a barrel mentality on us. And I would challenge the folks listening. Remember who the enemy is. When we look at each other and what you got, what you got and what she got and what I want, what she got. Always remember they got the most. It's an, it's, it's enough for everybody. Power sees nothing without demand. We should be looking mm-hmm. across the way, not at each other. And I will say, because I gave this testimony last week, I will say, um, as you all may know, we have a collective of women all in the space of media. Um, I, I can't, I won't want to name everybody, but Angela, Joy, Sunny, Brittany, Alicia, Aaron. Um, I'm gonna get in Jamel, trouble with somebody Carrie, out here. Well. Jamel, Latasha, Carrie, yes, Latasha Brown, yes. Our crew mm-hmm. is ten women 
all in media. We have never once looked at each other as competition. And I will tell you all that having that kind of sister, if you don't have that sisterhood, go out and create it, go out and find people. Because the thing is, when the ground drops from under you, you want to be able to look to your right and to your left and have sisters who, if nothing else by osmosis, have a collective energy to keep you from hitting rock bottom. And so Don't buy into the mentality because if you think it exists, then it tends to perpetuate. Find yourself, be the change. Find yourself in community with each other uh, and be giving and a blessing to everybody around you. What I was going to say first is, you know, one of our um, awesome Native Land pod family members asked about democracy. And today, um, Andrew, watching you struggle through with this wisdom tea thing. Um, whole thing, how he's oh, holding yeah. his mouth and everything. He's in pain. I um, actually want to strip the podcast of Democracy real quick, Twiff. Hopefully you'll join me in this. We can be bullies if we need to, Andrew. I think that you should consider waiting on sharing your really important story um, oh, yeah. until next time because I'm watching you struggle. Look how you holding your mouth right now. I poor <laughs> he's poor her. baby. Let these black was, women oh, call you brother. baby. Po po baby. Ah! I, I don't I want you to do it, ally. Andrew. I don't want you to do it. Um, Are you gonna be mad I, at us? Honestly, Andrew, I'm vetoing you. I'm I'm not mad at you. I'm I'm mad because this pain pill vetoed. is kicking off. Vetoed. It's too important. What you have oh, to say man. is too important. Mm-hmm. So I, if if you're good with it, I do think we should wait. Um, because I, I want people to hear your testimony and um what you survived and. I just, I know I have questions. I know Angela has questions. So, yeah, how you feel about waiting? I feel fine. That just means the listeners fine. won't get a full ninety minutes <laughs> of a of an episode. They're gonna get a they're gonna get sixty minutes of it. Yeah, <laughs> which is what we signed no, up I, you for. You know what? I bet they still get an hour and a half of it because <laughs> <laughs> now we got other about. topics. So here's my thing. You know, um, it's been really hard to watch what's happening in Georgia um, with the Fulton County DA. We see Uh, uh, Fannie Willis being um, kind of really raked across the coals based upon uh, her alleged personal decisions and relationship with the special prosecutor who she assigned to the Trump case. I believe we have sound. I would like to roll that sound. Yeah, we should say there was no proof, I think, in the filing. I don't know if we said that initially, but he didn't provide any proof. There, at this point, there is no proof. And what we do need to see is the judge is going to have a hearing on this case. It seems in early February. Mm-hmm. And then the judge is going to decide whether or not it is proved up. Here's my issue. I feel like black folks, we, we know this, like have to be twice as good. We, ca- we have to be able to hurdle the challenges of guilt in the court of public opinion. We have to, of course, be a, be ethically above reproach as attorneys. I know that as well as an attorney. Um, there are all of these bars that we have to hurdle. And this is such a massive um, distraction from the Trump case and all of the many civil and criminal allegations against him in courts throughout the land, both in state and federal court. And so to even have this, it's such, it's been such a massive distraction. It's so frustrating to watch this happen, but I don't think that we can have something called native land power. We talk about the, even our kitchen table issues and not bring this up. So I know y'all got strong feelings, but this, I just wanted to address it because to me, it feels like there's an elephant in the room and I at least want us to talk about what it is, but we knew sis was going to get dragged once she went after this man. Yeah. That's the thing is like, we knew she was going to face a heavy opposition. And my challenge with this is the media far too often plays into the right's hand and then they have to become reactive to it. This has nothing to do with the evidence in the case. And my challenge to the uh, media landscape would be every single time you talk about Fonnie Willis's personal life, please immediately follow that up with the recording of Donald Trump pressuring election officials to find an additional 11,000 votes. Now, all of a sudden, the story has become about her personal life. And it just seems like it is, um, it it, it seems like a red herring. It's irrelevant. It's fine if they want, that's something that you talk about in chambers or whichever. It doesn't take away from the crime that he is accused of committing in the state of Georgia, a state that is at the center of so many um, uh, elections, even this year, a state that 
that's on the verge of becoming purple. Like that is the more interesting conversation. That's the more fruitful conversation that will be informative to voters, not what she was doing personally with a member on her team. I, I, I find the entire thing distasteful. And as y'all know, I didn't even want to talk about it because I felt Definitely. like we were, you know, following fo- following their red herring. So I, 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 I'm ready this, for everybody to, to move on off this and, and keep the focus where it needs to be. I mean, this, this triggers me at a whole new level where mm-hmm. <clears throat> for a lot of reasons and reasons that I'm going to acquiesce to the advice of my colleagues. And so we'll share more and more of my, and unpack more and more of my own story, you know, in the coming weeks, but can somebody point to the, aside from there being no evidence inside this filing by the Trump folks, can somebody point me to the evidence in this Rico case that has been falsified mm-hmm. by Fani or by any member of her team? Can somebody Underscore for me where the lie is inside the charges that have been bought. The 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 evidence has been out of whole cloth made up and furtherance of the charges that they've levied against this man. This woman has been, along with her team, a more than superior prosecutor as it relates to these charges. And she knew she would have to be she, along with her team, would have to be because she was bringing a former president of the United States of America to account. Mm-hmm. You don't hear the Trump lawyers writing memos and asking for special hearings on any of the merits of any of this. And I know that it can be frustrating for so many of us who say we know off jump that we've got to be 10 times as better and 10 times as this and this is yeah. that. We all, yes, it's already baked in. But at some level, do we ever get to be measured for the job that we're actually up for? Mm. Do we ever, wh- when's the critique come down on the thing that I'm applying for? Or in proportionality to that thing that I'm applying for or applying my skill set toward, start undoing my credentials that then no longer stand in furtherance to the job that I'm doing. Mm. But nowhere in here does any of that exist at all. This is simply how can we come at this woman, degrade this woman, embarrass this woman, make her make her carry shame so that we don't have to pay attention to that big fat ass elephant in the middle of the room. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry for the you y'all know who get the apology. Man. <laughs> I think that's but, point. but instead of talking about the big thing sitting dead center in the room and the weight around the room is crashing in on it, all the walls. Let's talk about that tree outside across the street down the way. Dropping some fruit. That might then drop an acorn that might roll down the hill and possibly end up on the court lawn. Let's talk about that distraction. And so God knows I, I know were we to take all of this for truth, I, I, I am sure that the attorney, her staff, her team, all those folks are carrying a heavier weight today than they were yesterday because of a lot of this. Um, but I truly hope that to the extent that we address this in the future, that we're coming at it to hopefully shed a different type of light on it and not to pile on to the gossip arena that these folks are kicking up around this thing, the sideshow that they want us to be paying attention to rather the, 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 the crazy unprecedented stuff that it's in its proper place being litigated in a court of law. And I'm even embarrassed to hear that a judge has to hold a hearing taking up the court's time, dealing with something like this, when in actuality it bears no weight so far as any of us can see yeah. on the actual proceedings itself. I will show me the weight that it is it's bearing on that. And if there is a, if there is a charge to be bought before the Georgia bar, then bring it there. But so far as I'm concerned, I don't, I don't see it. I think this is this is only in a t- in, in, in intended to distract. And God knows I hope they all keep their heads up and do the job that they're there to do with no bias on any side of it. 
No bias on any side of it, except with a bias toward the law. Do that. I wish that, that, I wish that the same had been done in my court case, that the bias had been toward the law and not around an individual, whether you like them, you hate them, whether you admire their politics or you don't, whether because of the color of their skin, you think that they are prone to criminality right? or whether they've actually done something criminal. And that's the thing too. That's what I wish. That's what I wish this thing was about. That's the thing too, though, right? Like when I take a step back, if I were in the courtroom with the defendant, let's take Donald Trump out of it. This is absolutely something that would come up. So that part is not the distraction. Like you, you do have to demonstrate any potential bias that could come up in a case. You, you should bring that up. I think what is frustrating to me as a lawyer, I remember being in law school and prosecute, prosecuting prosecutors' offices trying to petition black law students to become prosecutors. They it, they had a really hard time getting us to stand on that side of the law because we don't want to be with the man. We we have family members who've had evidence planted on them, tampered evidence. You taking the money from a case and you like you like right? We know that. And so now there are there's the face of many black women prosecutors, Kamala Harris, Kim Fox, Marilyn Mosby. And most of them have been the subject of this kind of targeting. That's exactly why we don't want to go do this. So I understand the side of it where it's like, yes, this would come up in any court case. Like this is this is something that would be challenged if she appointed this man because of a personal relationship and any personal propriety. I'm saying if in propriety. Then, then that does come up. And to your point, Andrew, yes, it also does go to the bar. But I want us to be very aware of the fact, and we're all clear about the fact, that when black people, black women, choose to become prosecutors, what they have to deal with, the allegations lodged against them, how, the ways in which they have to defend their character, their integrity, and their ability to stand in the court of law as a prosecutor, it's just... It's it's it is remarkable. It really, really I, is. I think you Agreed. made a really good point, Angela, about the role of prosecutors, because that's something that gets sweeped over as well. One, mm -hmm. um, black people need to pursue these positions because prosecutors decide what charges will be brought, if any charges yeah. will be brought. So it you do serve a role there. And again, I have to say um, the media played a role, a huge role in who gets to be prosecutors as well. When for the first time, when media started mm -hmm. paying outsized attention to police brutality, that is when people paid attention to who prosecutors were. When they started paying attention to that, then you saw the election of Kim Fox in Illinois. You saw the election of Marilyn Mosby uh, in Baltimore. You saw the election of multiple um, uh, prosecutors uh, of color across the country. So just keep in mind, these are elected positions. People run to be DAs all over the country. This is an area where you have uh, a role in democracy. This is an area where you can say, this is what I want my government to look like. And prosecutors play an outside role in a very unforgiving criminal justice system when it comes to black and brown folks. So that's all I got I'll on that. Say, I've, I've also heard rumors and I've, I've totally blown the gasket because I'm past my pain meds and my mm. mouth is giving me real problems at the moment. But I just have to say, I've heard rumors on rumors on rumors of not just, you know, prosecutors in my area and who they relate to and who they socialize with and who they take trips with. And it's so well known, you know, in these circles. And I've never in a legitimate environment heard, I think back to, again, I, I will deepen into my own story at the right time for myself and for our listeners. But I'm looking at, the local newspaper showing clips of me vacationing with a guy, I'll just say for the sake of this conversation, Sean, who I've known and interned with my sophomore year in high school and have known ever since at his wedding, the birth of his kids, so on and so forth. Pictures of he and I being on vacation as if it is somehow nefarious and untoward. Yet colleagues who sat on the same council who were on vacation with others, people who did business to the tune of millions and millions of dollars with the city government, not a mention of them, mm -hmm. not a not a photograph, right. of them, not a mention, not of anything. So the fact that when we do something that there's got to be something untoward and nefarious associated with it, and when they're doing it, they're just living, they're just existing, 
they're just they're 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 upright and wholesome. And I just the the double standard that exists there between the type of scrutiny between what we do that is commonplace, that is every day, that is normal for them, that we've got to justify and explain and explain away and justify and answer questions yeah. about when we're just living, paying our own way, maybe treating this friend to a lunch. No one ever interrogates. Their, the affordability. And by the way, if I'm not mistaken, this question has to do with a flight that he may have bought for assume somebody he was dating and that person he's dating happens to be an attorney. So she trumped up this whole excuse, pardon the pun, but tr made up this whole case against Trump so she could get a free flight paid for by the government, a flight she could have bought herself. I mean, I just I it, it, it's incredible to me the lengths that we have to go to prove that we are just living an everyday experience similar to the ones that they have every day. We're we going to have to set aside 45 minutes for Andrew's testimony because he, he has so much to say about it. And I have a lot of questions about it. I know a little bit about it, but Andrew, I, I mean, seriously, I have to tell you, people have no idea what you went through. So I'm very much yes. looking forward to you sharing that part of your story because I think it highlights the corrupt nature of what can happen when power is in the wrong hands. So thank you for giving us a teaser there, a little tidbit, but um, I, I'm very much looking forward to that in the coming weeks. All right, when we come back, we're going to do a call to action, but we got to pay some bills first. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. It is now time for us to do our call to action. As you know, every week we will have a call to action for our Native Land Pod family. So this week, kicking off the call to action, I am going to kick it to my sister, who I just want to say this. She might get mad at me for saying it, but she's wearing her hair big today. And I think it looks so beautiful when she lets her hair just dry oh, and it and looks big request. and beautiful and curly and bouncy and healthy. Her cousin Mia does my hair, too. So shout out to Mia. Angela, what's your call to action? Moisturize the hair, condition the hair. <laughs> um, I'm going to I told you that I mean, we didn't actually play his sound, but the uh, New Hampshire GOP. I think he's the vice chair. Oh, yeah. Has some dreadlocks <laughs> that started that. about right here. And I told Tiff this was how my ish was going to look when I leave. So let me just show y'all. <laughs> Look I'm, how pretty, I'm pretty that hair is. I'm pretty damn close. <laughs> but, um, you know, my call to action is is one that I'm so excited about because, um, you know, a lot of times people want to call you out. But the people who really love you and I think the listenership that we're beginning to build <sighs> want to call us in and sometimes corrective action can be loving. So there was a, there's some folks in the indigenous community who reached out last week and they were worried about feeling erased with, with the pod. And I asked them if they'd heard um, some of our explanations. Um, some of them I know we're going to release. We have about 15 minutes of a conversation where we talked about what native land pod means to us. And so my first call to action to all of you is to think about what native land pod means to you what it means to have um, a place where you can be home, even if it is virtual for an hour or so, or so, emphasis on or, or so every week. And then this, the second thing I would do is even when you're in conflict with someone, I would like for you to take a step back. Think about what it means to communicate your position outside of the lane of fear and talk to them from your real perspective. You might be afraid of being a race because that's all you've ever seen as an individual or as a person. But what if that wasn't their intent? What if their desire, their deepest desire, our deepest desire is for you to feel seen and heard, which is indeed the case. And so shout out to the community who said, we don't necessarily feel seen and heard. And here are some of the ways that you can invite us in. Make sure that we have a seat at the table because our seat was stolen when we just offered a seat to others. I'm so grateful for that. You will hear more about that. It will be a surprise for next week um, from um, some more of that conversation and what we decided as a collective, as a coalition for how we can ensure indigenous folks, Indian country, and every other BIPOC community member has a seat at the table and always feels welcome home here. So that's my call to action. I love that. I love, love, love that call to action. Um, as y'all know, Andrew had surgery and is, uh, dealing poor, poor baby. We're going to call, I think we should call Andrew <laughs> baby every baby. episode. Don't. Do it like, no, um, baby. Yeah. Yes. There's a whole thing about that too. We can dive deep. Okay. On that. You don't really? remember baby boy? Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. That's true. No. We could get into not that. Not Jody, my Jody. Um, not Andrew, Jody, my Jody. 
because we talk politics all the time um, and my call to action has nothing to do with politics, I was going to jump in and give my call to action and let you close out the show. But I want to make sure you feel okay to do that. Um, I'm good. Okay. So my call to action has nothing to do with politics and I'll be really quick. My call to action is please adopt. Don't shop. If you know me, you know I love dogs and I see people oh. go to breeders all the time and it just breaks my heart because pit bulls are my absolute favorite breed. They are the nicest, sweetest dogs. Don't believe the hype. And tens of thousands are euthanized every month in shelters. And so I say if you want to welcome a pet into your home, please visit your local animal shelter. Uh, they are amazing dogs there. You don't have to go to a breeder. If you don't want to go to a shelter, at least go to a rescue program if you're looking for a specific breed. Um, but dogs are commitments. I mean, these are like two-year-old toddlers who never grow up. And it is a 12 to 15-year commitment to care um, for your fur babies. So please adopt, don't shop. That's my call to action. I like that. Thanks, Tiff. I like Thank that. Thank you. Mine is very personal this week, y'all, which is get your wisdom teeth pulled before you end up in your <laughs> mid-40s. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. He yes. needs that from what his supposed soul. supposed to be your one-week healing? Yes. Go to the dentist. Go <laughs> to the dentist. Yeah. Um, so first of all, we just want to thank you all. We're starting to get so many more questions uh, and we love to bring you all right in. We say welcome home and we mean it. So please make sure you're submitting your questions to us on social media. Make sure you send your name and where you're from at the top of that question and ask us all the real. We will try to make sure we get to it every week. You can follow us at Native Lamb Pod. Before we end the show, I want to remind everyone to leave us a review and subscribe. We did a handy dandy, dandy social video last week. I hope you check it out. Super easy. Subscribe to Native Land Pod. We're available on all platforms where you get your podcast and on YouTube. New episodes drop every Thursday. We say around 10 ish a.m. Uh, Eastern. You can also follow us on social media again at Native Land Pod. We are Angela Rye, Tiffany Cross, Andrew Gillum, and there are 284 days until Election Day. Welcome home, y'all. You can say welcome home. home. <laughs> Native Lamb Pod is a production of iHeartRadio in partnership with Reason Choice Media. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.